Great. Um, so uh, we'll go ahead and start now. This is uh, Mark McClellan. I'm the director of the Duke Margola Center for Health Policy. On behalf of our team here at Duke and our collaborators on this uh, real-world evidence um, effort, I want to thank all of you for your participation in today's webinar. Our topic is bolstering real-world evidence study credibility and its role in a totality of evidence approach. Uh, this has involved a number of people. You'll be hearing from them on the webinar, and I want to give a special thanks to uh, our team at uh, Duke Margolis, uh, Narosha, Kara, and, and others who you'll be hearing from as well. Um, to get started, just a few housekeeping reminders. Please stay on mute during the webinar uh, when you're not speaking so that um, we can uh, maximize the quality of the sound for everyone. If you would like to suggest a question for our panelists to discuss, please use the chat function. Uh, hopefully you can see that on your um, WebEx login for, uh, for this event. Um, that will send your question to the webinar's host, Kara Marson and she'll make sure that we get to as many of these questions in the discussion time as possible. Uh, one more thing, the webinar is being reported. It'll be archived on our website, so hopefully others who uh, want to join but couldn't make it with all of us right now will be able to use it, and uh, we just want to make you aware of that as well. We've got a lot to cover, so I want to get going right away. And I can start with uh, just some of the key terminology here. I think uh, all of you know real-world evidence isn't just about evidence. It's about the data that underlies the evidence and the methods to get there. So uh, just in terms of definitions, real-world data are data relating to patient health status um, and the delivery of health care that are routinely collected in the delivery of health care from a variety of sources, including electronic health record, claims data, registries, mobile apps, digital technologies, and an increasing range of sources uh, as uh, digital technology continues to advance. Real-world evidence is what's derived from real-world real data through the application of research methods. And uh, understanding these concepts and applying them has important uh, implications, obviously, for uh, the whole field of, of developing and using um, uh, real-world evidence in decision-making processes. Uh, as the next slide shows, real-world data and real-world evidence studies shouldn't be viewed in isolation, but can complement data and evidence generated from randomized controlled trials, uh, things that aren't real-world evidence, and contribute to a more robust and comprehensive evidence package. And indeed, there's a well-established history of FDA using real-world evidence to support labeling changes related to safety, and even in, uh, in some cases, using real-world evidence studies on questions related to labeling changes for effectiveness. Um, we think that there, with the expanding use of data and the expanding um, development of, of methods and, and understanding these methods, that there are going to be a lot more opportunities to expand these uses, however. Um, so as part of the Prescription Drug User Fee Act and 21st Century Cures Act uh, provisions, FDA is taking more steps to support the expanded use of real-world evidence. FDA released its real-world evidence framework in December of 2018, and that lays out the potential use of real-world evidence to support changes to labeling related to effectiveness for marketed drugs and biologics. And the framework highlights three core areas um, for uh, development of real-world evidence. And the first is uh, whether the real-world data are fit for use. Second is whether the trial or study design used to generate the real-world evidence can provide adequate scientific evidence to help answer uh, the, the regulatory question, sort of uh, methods fit for use, I think is a way to think about that. And then third, uh, getting into the conduct of the study, whether the study conduct meets FDA regulatory requirements? Was it well executed from the standpoint of data collection and study monitoring and the execution of the methods uh, appropriately? And the, these three core elements all make sense. Uh, uh, they've got some analogs, I think, on the, the, the randomized study side, uh, but uh, they are at a pretty high level, and the concepts would clearly benefit from some further elucidation on how they can be applied in practice. So in this webinar, we're going to focus on that second uh, key consideration about 
study designs and methods that are fit for use that can provide adequate scientific evidence related to the important regulatory question at hand. Related to this topic, Duke Margolis has two major initiatives underway on real-world evidence. First of these is through our cooperative agreement with the FDA. Today's work reflects our second major initiative and work stream, our real-world evidence collaborative, which includes stakeholder experts from uh, manufacturers, product developers, from academic research groups, um, from uh, data organizations and, and data analytic organizations, from providers, from patient uh, networks, uh, all of whom have provided input for key considerations for advancing uh, the use of real-world study design and methods. So this project is made possible through the support of the Margolis Family Foundation that provides the core resources for the Duke Margolis Center, as well as from a combination of financial and in-kind contributions from consortium members, including product developers, uh, Abby, Amgen, Eli Lilly, Genentech, uh, which is a member of the Roach Group, GlaxoSmithKline, Merck, Novartis, Pfizer, Teva and UCB, uh, as well as a wide range of other individuals and organizations participating in this effort, um, uh, as you see on this uh, slide. There are several questions, uh, several outstanding questions related to real-world data and real-world evidence decision-making, including, as we just talked about, uh, data fitness for use, study conduct, and study credibility. And uh, in collaboration with the FDA over the past year, we explored study design and analytical considerations for demonstrating valid causal, efference, uh, valid causal inference using observational studies at, our, at an October meeting on developing real-world evidence to support regulatory decision-making. And uh, that uh, webcast and other supporting information is available on our website. Today, we're focusing on two more recent Duke Margolis white papers on real-world study credibility and totality of evidence. These papers address how real-world evidence study methods can be used to generate credible evidence and how real-world evidence can be used to support product effectiveness labeling changes through a totality of evidence approach. Uh, these papers are authored by the Duke Margolis team, but they really are a team effort. They were informed by a literature review, a full-day private workshop on this subject, and the expert input from the Real World Evidence Collaborative Methods Working Group, part of that Real World Evidence Collaborative that I just described. So I'd like to take this opportunity to thank the Methods Work Group. Uh, you can see there the members uh, listed here, as well as the Real World Evidence Collaborative Advisory Group, whose extensive expertise, whose ongoing work, and whose insightful comments were integral to the development of this paper. And I'm pleased that you're going to get a chance to hear from some of them uh, in just a few minutes. So for this first panel today, we're going to focus on the topic of real-world evidence study credibility with a special emphasis on non-interventional studies or observational studies that use secondary data, real-world data, um, to, uh, uh, for, for their conduct. And in particular, this paper discusses some of the feasibility challenges to conducting interventional studies in the real world. Um, why those aren't done more often, ethical, operational, resource barriers, and other, uh, other uh, uh, concerns and obstacles. The paper also highlights key considerations for how to demonstrate the credibility of a non-interventional study using secondary data. And that includes a discussion of anal analyst analytic methods, uh, of uh, biases that these methods are intended to address, a whole set of uh, components to consider in the conduct of these non-interventional uh, studies, and how uh, the, the uh, methods and the, uh, and the steps that they're trying to address can map to the characteristics of an adequate and well-controlled study. Uh, and again, that's what's the, the, the core framework in, in FDA's regulations. So um, we've got a great panel to discuss this topic, and we're going to start by hearing from Jenny Christian, who's a Methods Working Group member, to provide a high-level overview of the paper, and then we're going to hear reactions from 
other panel members and have some time for discussion. I'll introduce those other participants in, after uh, Jenny's remarks, but uh, uh, first off, Dr. Christian is Vice President of Clinical Evidence and Epidemiology within the Center for Advanced Evidence Generation uh, at IQVIA. Uh, again, uh, at any point during the course of this um, uh, webinar, you can submit questions or comments that you have directly to the host through the chat function, and we're going to try to get to as many of those as possible uh, to, to build out this discussion. But right now, uh, let's start with Jenny. Jenny, are, are you on? Can you, can you hear me okay? Yes, thank you, Mark. And a quick Great. Thank Please you go ahead. Oh, thank you. Uh, a quick thank you to my methods working group colleagues for, for developing and discussing these two papers uh, today, and, and the Duke Margolis team, especially Narosha and Joy Eckert, for driving these papers forward. So, um, as Mark said, I'm Jennifer Christian. I've been given the privilege of summarizing the first of these two papers today. Um, next slide. So, this, this first paper uh, covers two main topics. First, it lays out the need and circumstances for conducting non-interventional studies to evaluate clinical effectiveness for regulatory decision making, particularly when traditional and real-world interventional studies may not be suited to address the research question. And then the second thing it does is demonstrate uh, the credi how to or discuss ways to demonstrate the credibility of findings that are generated from non-interventional studies. So this includes a discussion of various methods used in non-interventional studies and how this study's design can achieve the characteristics of an adequate and well-controlled study that's defined in the FDA regulations. So we'll talk about um, each of these topics in more detail. Next slide. But, but first, quickly, why did we write this paper? We did so because the FDA has identified this particular topic as a priority within the framework, stating that the FDA will issue guidance about observational study designs using real-world data, including whether and how these studies might provide real-world evidence to support product effectiveness in regulatory decision-making. And so, you know, we wanted to inform this guidance with our thinking on um, observational real-world studies using secondary data, specifically. Next slide. And we know that there are already a number of regulatory decisions uh, happening around effectiveness that have been informed by real-world design. Um, and many of these decisions have been based on non-interventional real-world study designs that have led to new drug approvals and label extensions by regulators. Um, so this is already happening. Next slide. But one of the reasons this is already happening is because there are many occasions where a non-interventional real-world design um, may be more appropriate than an interventional approach. And so we provide a detailed discussion in the paper, including uh, making the following points. First, when clinical equipoise may not be present, such as when a novel treatment appears far superior than current regimens available, then it would be considered unethical to randomize, and a non-interventional approach may be best. Um, next is studying rare diseases and rare outcomes. That can be challenging using interventional studies, especially regarding recruitment and sample size challenges, often um, limited number of treatment options available. Uh, time is, in general, is a potential barrier for interventional studies, including considering the time for recruitment, the time to follow patients for outcomes, especially those with long lag time or long exposure windows, whereas non-interventional real-world studies using secondary data may be designed to look back in time and therefore conducted efficiently to address the research questions. Another important consideration is how resource intensive these interventional studies can be, including time to complete them, the human capital involved in running them, and the financial costs, of course. So there are many opportunities where real-world non-interventional studies can be used for evaluating clinical effectiveness. And in addition, they can be complementary to interventional findings by evaluating research questions and outcomes that aren't routinely 
included in randomized trials, such as healthcare resource utilization. Next slide, please. So the big question and really the bulk of the paper is how do we consider when a non-interventional real-world study meets the definition of adequate and well-controlled? And, and we tackled this by starting by mapping the seven characteristics of an adequate and well-controlled study that is defined within the 21 CFR 314 regulations and map them to the design and methods used within a non-interventional study. So in the paper, we go into quite a bit of detail for each one of these characteristics, but I'll try to quickly recap some of these important elements. The first characteristic speaks to the importance of study reporting and transparency of the methods and approaches that are used. And this is important in studies using real-world data because we know that data dredging can be a concern for regulators. So an essential part of building study credibility is prospectively identifying the research questions that one aims to answer and specifying the study approach and study protocols and the statistical analysis plans, recognizing that you know, not all sensitivity analyses will be pre-specified and that this is specific to real-world studies testing hypotheses especially regarding treatment effectiveness, and, and doesn't apply to all descriptive analyses and, and hypothesis-generating studies that we often conduct. But there is a need to engage the FDA early and often prior to study initiation um, so that the FDA can review study protocols and SAPs. The, the second characteristic implies two important study design features and observational studies, including selecting the appropriate comparison group, and establishing time or temporal anchors. So this means that the comparison group should have as close to the same characteristics as the interventional group as possible. And temporality is critical in retrospective studies. So for example, addressing length of exposure or and considering temporal ordering of exposure and then outcomes um, are critical. The third characteristic focuses on reducing misclassification. So this speaks to the importance of having a fit-for-purpose data set with the necessary level of granularity captured to address the study question. And as researchers, we need to provide reasonable assurance in the information captured, and that may mean using some validated algorithms where applicable. So we need to consider how well does the real-world data capture the exposure, the outcome, key variables, and, and does it follow patients over a sufficient amount of time to answer the question. Number four is related to how patients are assigned to treatment versus comparator group to minimize selection bias in an observational study. So it's necessary to ensure that characteristics of both groups are balanced with respect to known and unknown confounders. And while randomization is a tool in interventional studies to address the issue. There are a number of methods that can be used in non-interventional studies to address known and unknown confounding in the design phase and or in the analytic phase that we'll present shortly. The fifth component addresses the need to mitigate information bias that can occur when study participants or clinical assessors or even data analysts change their behavior consciously or unconsciously based on knowledge of a subject's treatment status or other factors. So for example, more intensive follow-up of the newer treatment versus the known standard of care could lead to more intensive um, ascertainment of events for the newer treatment um, than the comparator group. Blinding with the use of a placebo is the approach that we often use in traditional RCTs but in real-world studies, placebos are not used. And in non-interventional studies using secondary data sources, the decisions and care have already been provided. So for these studies, sufficient attention should be paid in estimating and adjusting for potential information bias and possibly selecting objective endpoints that are less likely to be influenced by interpretation. The sixth characteristic addresses the need for accurate and reliable methods of assessment. In the real world, encounters with the healthcare system are not protocolized like in trials, so there are often gaps in clinical data over time. It may not be missing data 
per se, just that the health care activity may not have been done. Uh, therefore, it's critical for researchers to use fit-for-purpose data that are well characterized regarding data collection and aggregation and, and outcome ascertainment. Also, if you begin to quantify the size and the direction of measurement bias, it may be possible to adjust for variability in measurements. And so we mentioned several of these types of sensitivity analyses in the paper to consider for di different circumstances. And lastly, the analysis selected for the study should be appropriate and adequately address the effects of confounding, which can distort the true relationship under, under study between the treatment and the outcome. So in this next slide, we present table two of the paper, which depicts tools for addressing confounding in the design and analysis phases by whether the confounding variables are measured or unmeasured. As you know, unknown confounding is the greatest concern because we're not implementing randomization in these non-interventional real-world studies. However, over the past 30 years, the field of pharmacoepidemiology has developed and evaluated a number of robust methods to make valid and reliable estimates of benefit and safety that can be used. And remember that before even getting to this phase, it's critical to use a real-world study design that is sufficient to address the question, meaning that the exposure and outcomes are well measured um, over the length of time necessary and that the important confounders are captured. So once the design and data are selected, then one or more of these tools can be implemented to address confounding. Uh, final slide. So in summary, uh, we're moving swiftly towards an environment where real-world data and real-world evidence are being used by a broad set of stakeholders for clinical, regulatory, and payer decision-making. And there are a number of opportunities where non-interventional real-world studies can be used to measure clinical effectiveness. Um, and we believe that these designs can meet the adequate and well-controlled criteria outlined in the FDA regulations. So let's just keep in mind that we need to engage regulators and really any stakeholders ahead of doing the study to ensure that there is alignment on the approach and, and the key study objectives. Also that the real world endpoints and many of the variables actually will, may look different from those used in phase two and phase three trials because they are intended to reflect what is routinely captured in clinical care. But overall, you know, these re real world studies should and will contribute to the totality of evidence that is being generated to evaluate clinical effectiveness and safety of new treatments. So I'm looking forward to having that discussion next after we uh, hear from our panelists on this paper. Thank you. That's right, Jenny. Thank you very much. So, uh, for for all that uh, you presented in a short time period, and again, we encourage people to go back to the paper for more details. Um, we are going to turn to our panelists now, and uh, then have a little time for discussion. Please do submit any questions or comments you have through the chat function to help uh, guide that. Um, we're going to hear first from uh, our colleagues at the Division of Pharmacoepidemiology in the Department of Medicine at Brigham and Women's Hospital in Harvard Medical School. Uh, Joss Gagne is an Associate Professor of Medicine there uh, and also in the Department of Epidemiology at the Chan School of Public Health. Uh, he works with Sebastian Snaveis, who's Professor of Medicine and Epidemiology and uh, Chief of the Division of Pharmacoepidemiology there and overseeing a uh, large amount of work that um, uh, this group, uh, Sebastian, Josh, and colleagues are doing in this space. So uh, I think we're going to hear first from, or mainly from, from Josh as part of this effort, but uh, Sebastian, glad to have you with us too. And we're also going to hear from Joe Ross, who's Professor of Medicine and Public Health at the Yale School of Medicine, doing much work in this area, and Bill Crown, the Chief Scientific Officer of Optum Labs, uh, also uh, um, undertaking a, a lot of efforts and expanded use of real-world evidence. And finally, uh, Keely Wurst, who's Director of Epidemiology 
at uh, for value, evidence, and outcomes at uh, at GSK. Uh, thanks to all of you. We're going to have five minutes for comments from uh, each of these perspectives, and starting with uh, Josh and Sebastian. Thanks, Mark. This is Josh. I want to first start by thanking Jenny for really um, a nice effort on the report and a, a nice presentation of the findings of the report. Um, it's an impressive body uh, of work um, that summarizes a lot of uh, complex issues in a very thoughtful and comprehensive way. So congratulations on that. Um, there are two points that I wanted to raise in the time that I have. So uh, the first one is that I think the report does a wonderful job of describing the differences, and, and Jenny get into this on the presentation as well, between the RCT and the RWE settings. That is, differences with respect to um, elements of an RCT that can and importantly cannot be transferred to the RWE setting. Um, you mentioned specifically blinding and the opportunity for differential surveillance in the RWE space if patients are given one treatment versus a standard of care, for example. I think one of the areas in which uh, we as a community in the RWE space um, should be focused on is how do we transfer the concept of a placebo-controlled study from the RTC setting to the RWE setting. And I, I think it's there where some of these issues that you mentioned become even more salient. So how do we identify even a comparison group for um, sort of replicating an RCT in real-world data where placebos just don't exist, right? And, uh, and there are differences in, of course, patients that use a particular treatment versus those that don't. And those differences may be more stark than what we observe in active comparator studies that, uh, that I think we can do quite well. So I think that's sort of a challenge for the field in general. And I think there, we have a lot of tools in our toolbox that you described very nicely in the report. Um, and I just want to raise this as an issue to think about um, how do we think about implementing these tools specifically in that space of placebo-controlled studies. The second item I wanted to raise is that um, there's a lot of initiatives that are large-scale initiatives, really, that are going on uh, trying to demonstrate the in general, the credibility of RWE studies. So there's the duplicate study, for example, out of the Brigham here. There's the operand study. Um, and these are really important initiatives to demonstrate that um, in some cases, and to understand in which cases RWE can get results that uh, are similar to what RCTs might produce. I think that what's also needed for every single RWE study is that we're able to demonstrate the credibility of the findings of that particular study. The report does a really nice job in terms of going into ways that we can do this, and Jenny got into this with the presentation about approaches to deal with both measured and unmeasured confounding. Um, I think that for every single study, it's going to be incumbent on the investigators to demonstrate that um, not only have we followed everything that you've outlined very nicely here, but that the results themselves are highly unlikely to be explained by other causes. Obviously, we don't have the power of randomization in these RWE studies, um, but I think there's a lot of things that we can do to exclude potential other explanations for the results that we observe. Um, you mentioned in the report negative control outcomes and sensitivity analyses. Those are critical, um, and it's great to see those. I think another consideration might be that we can also think about positive control outcomes, that is, uh, ways to demonstrate that the study can actually find results that we expect to find. So sometimes that's referred to as uh, positive outcomes for demonstrating assay sensitivity, for example. Um, there's other approaches as well, and I think this um, is something that we should continue to think about. There's new approaches being developed to detect unmeasured confounding and differences in surveillance, as you mentioned. Um, I think one promising approach is uh, looking within data-rich subsets of the populations that we study. So, for example, if we're uh, looking within an administrative claims database, there may be a subset of patients in that population that have richer data, maybe lab data or data from linked electronic health record data. And there's a lot that we can do to explore whether the results from the claims-based study could be credible, that is, that they're valid by looking within that subgroup. So maybe there's a variable missing at the claims level that we can then get into the EHR data to examine to see whether it's balanced between our treatment groups. That would be one example. Um, and I think the kind of field of detecting unmeasured confounding is moving forward, um, and so I think there'll be a lot of other approaches for us to consider into the future. But, but overall, this is, a, again, a really important piece of work, and I, I thank you for the opportunity for, uh, to, to review it and to comment on it as well. 
Great. Uh, thanks, Josh and Sebastian, too, for all the work you've done in this area and this discussion. I, I like to focus on unmeasured confounding and, and further developments there. Those are great to watch. Um, next, we're going to hear from uh, Joe Ross at, from Yale. Hi, Mark. Uh, thanks for having me, and I'm delighted to be participating this, in this webinar. The, uh, you know, I, I have to say I share so much of the enthusiasm that's now being, uh, you know, that we're hearing about the opportunities to use these types of, you know, observational re uh, data sources to, for, to generate real-world evidence for medical products and evaluation. Um, you know, I, I think that I was, I'm probably brought in here to be a little bit of a, um, a, a skeptic, or at least I would be remiss to not be skeptical. I think that while there's a substantial opportunity, we, ha we really have to think critically and hard about um, you know, how to make sure that these data are, are fit for purpose and, and can be used for the purposes we want them to be used for. I think, you know, Josh uh, made a number of really important comments around, um, you know, how to think about methods and identifying um, the treatment groups and the samples and, you know, the issue of, uh, plus, you know, either conducting and or replicating a placebo-controlled trial uh, using observational data is so much trickier when, um, you know, the treatment decision is not at, at, the, at uh, you know, based on a randomization at the point of care, but instead is based on, you know, regular treatment patterns, you know, in, in the world. Uh, but that even, you know, with my skepticism, I think that there are, there are, there are great opportunities. And, you know, we've been doing a, a lot of work trying to sort of pressure test uh, the data sources and think about how, how it can best be used, some work with FDA, some work with NIST, some work with others. Um, and it's really exciting that so many people are on this call and are thinking about these issues and how to do it well. You know, I'll just note some, some of the, the challenges we face, you know, when you're trying to take advantage of data that's collected for other purposes, be it for billing or be it for, you know, as part of electronic health record, and then trying to use it to, to do product evaluation. One of the, the biggest challenges, of course, is the challenge of follow-up, right? So within claims data, you, you, you have great follow-up, but when you're trying to get at the, you know, the electronic health record data that has much more uh, clinical information and nuance and, you know, potentially vital signs and lab tests and such like that. The, the follow-up is often quite challenging across health systems. So, you know, we did one project where we were, you know, trying to understand, you know, an oncology drug use. And what we found is that, you know, more than half of the papers, or sorry, half of the patients who were initially prescribed, um, you know, this oncologic therapy received only one prescription in our system and then went off and to get, continue to get care uh, in, in other systems closer to their home. So, you know, it raises these issues, you know, when, you know, how to manage uh, patients and observations and follow-up when people are coming to tertiary centers for care and, and, and such. So that's, that's just, you know, one little anecdote. I will say we are doing some really innovative work that we're excited about that tries to um, essentially take advantage of the electronic health record data, but while also creating complementary data sources to, to, to achieve better follow-up. So we're partnering with um, a, a mobile health platform company called Hugo Health, a patient-centered data sharing platform, which allows us to aggregate healthcare data across different settings, along with pulling information about patient report of outcome measures and others to, to uh, enroll patients at the point of care and then follow them over time gives us prescription information and patient data along with uh, other uh, outcome measures and activity data and Fitbit data and whatnot. And this is actually, you know, kind of a great way to think about how to, you know, create complementary data sources to, to bring in uh, additional information and, and not just say, you know, real-world data is what we have now, but to think about the future and how we can make it stronger and better and use it uh, for the purposes that we want to use it for, then apply, the, you know, the methods that we can, the best, the best case methods. Um, to, to, to make sure our, our observations are robust. And I guess what, the one other thing I'll say, which is the, you know, I think as our culture shifts towards taking advantage of these data, using them for regulatory purposes, you know, um, one of the things that Jennifer talked a lot about was the idea of the adequate and well-controlled study. And, you know, traditionally, right, we think about that as, the, you know, a single clinical trial that's providing adequate evidence. And I think that as we move towards, you know, taking advantage of observational data, I think we have to think about, you know, what is at, adequate and well-controlled and how many studies uh, should be done. Because one of the advantages of using observational data is we can test it, the same observations in different samples in different settings. Uh, and that assurance of, of identifying the same effect estimate, the same safety estimate in multiple settings, I think, is what's going to be needed for, for regulatory decision making. So uh, I'm delighted to be here, and uh, thanks for inviting me. Uh, uh, thanks very much, Joe. Great, great comments. We're going to come back to this, uh, these issues around putting together evidence from different sources in the, the next panel, too. Um, but probably also in this one, I know Bill uh, Crown has done some work in this area as well. Bill, we're over to you next. 
Thanks very much, Mark. Um, no, I think uh, I want to congratulate the, um, uh, the Duke Margolis team for this this paper. I think it's uh, it is really uh, important and valuable. And Jenny did a great job summarizing it. Um, as I sort of think about the issues of using these observational data for regulatory decision making, I I think ultimately it gets to this issue of how close can we get uh, to um, causality with observational studies? Um, that's certainly been uh, the evidence-based framework for most of the regulatory decision-making of the FDA in the past. And causality in observational studies is influenced um, by the data, it's influenced by research design, and it's influenced by statistical methods. Um, and we tend to we tend to focus a lot on statistical methods as the you know the way more sophisticated methods help us to get more reliable estimates from these observational data sets. But um, in the past week or so, we've had a lot of uh, a lot of uh, references to baseball in the um, in the in the news. And I would I would say that statistical methods uh, are the, are are batting cleanup. Um, and they're really there to sort of help us to address uh, various kinds of limitations in the data, whether it's um, time varying covariates or censoring on outcomes or, you know, unobserved variables. Uh, the worse the data is, the more sophisticated the methods need to be uh, in order to, to clean up the problems. Um, so. Uh, the beauty of clinical trials, randomized trials, of course, is that they they solve a lot of those problems on the front end uh, by randomization and balancing uh, the comparison groups on the basis of both observed and unobserved um, uh, uh, covariates. Uh, but um, they don't necessarily guarantee that uh, because a, randomized, a study is randomized that it's a, a quality study. There are still issues of research design and um, uh, how the patients were selected and the length of follow-up and, um, and so forth. Um, so th I think the fact that this uh, paper focuses on design uh, is, uh, is very, very important. Um, because uh, where we need to go, I think, in terms of regulatory grade evidence from observational studies is to be thinking of um, these studies as though we were going to do a clinical trial and, uh, with um, pre-specified protocols that say this is what the question is, um, uh, this is what the data is, this is how uh, uh, we intend to kind of uh, draw our, our best attempt at a causal inference from a statistical method standpoint uh, and so forth. Um, uh, Joe uh, made the comment about, um, you know, sort of this, this role of both observational studies and, um, and uh, randomized trials, and I think that's a really important study. He, there was a, he was a co-author on a, a paper in Geminet, um, uh a couple of months ago, uh, which really um, addresses the issue of uh, how, uh, how broad-based are the questions that one can answer uh, with observational studies. And I, I think we know that we have uh, a lot of um, evidence from the literature that in cardiometabolic areas, for example, the data tends to be very good and uh, very strong. Uh, and uh, we've had great success there. But in certain other areas, um, such as in cancer, are, uh, it's very difficult to measure certain things, such as disease progression. And so, uh, where that brings me is that in the end, we're always going to have a need for both randomized designs and for observational studies, and that gets to the totality of evidence that really will be the, uh, the focus of the second session in this um, webinar. So that's it for me, Mark. Bill, thank, thanks very much for the comments and, and for uh, all your engagement on this. Uh, we really appreciate it. And uh, next, I'd like to turn to Keeley Worth. Thanks, Mark. And um, I just want to echo what the others have said that the paper does a really nice job of highlighting the benefits of modern interventional studies using secondary data, and Jenny did a great job summarizing this. One of the areas that I'd like to talk about more is how researchers can produce high-quality evidence to increase trust and credibility. 
As the others have mentioned, the paper highlights that individual researchers are responsible for the data, using data that are fit for use and study methods that are appropriate. Really understanding what the data and methods that are most appropriate for the study question is critical. It's never a one size fits all. Factors such as disease and disease severity, available treatment alternatives, and most importantly, the study question really need to be taken into account. Using the right data source and the right population is of utmost importance. I think researchers should critically examine and assess the feasibility of a data source to make sure it has the relevant variables before even beginning a study. They need to have knowledge of the prevalence of certain factors in a population that can impact the study question. And as Jenny mentioned, I think it's really important that there needs to be transparency and clear communication to regulators regarding these data and methods. But we also need to have transparency regarding the limitations of the data and explanations of methods to address these limitations. The other thing is I think we need to improve validation studies. The paper mentioned this. Um, the validation studies should be conducted against robust gold standards. I mean, acknowledging that this is a complex issue, that there are some cases where gold standards don't exist or gold standards are defined by what's in the medical record, which we know may not be, may be complete or not complete. Um, complex trial endpoints can also be difficult to translate, and so we really need validation here. And validation studies also need to be published, again, for transparency, and details of algorithms need to be shared among researchers. Ongoing initiatives to compare endpoints in secondary data, such as EHR and claims, to clinical trial data is another activity that I think can improve trust and credibility of secondary data. For example, GSK is collaborating with the Duke Clinical Research Institute on the Harmony Ancillary Study, which some of you may have heard about in the FDA framework. Um, the aim of this study is to assess how structured data captured in the AHR compares to data on baseline patient characteristics and endpoints captured in the CRF of the clinical trial. This study will be finished sometime this year and will provide guidance as to what's the best use of the EHR data. Is it supplementation to the CRF? Can it provide adjudication information? Or can it replace the CRF altogether? And what characteristics or endpoints would be most appropriate? And this study is assessing cardiac endpoints, but I think the methods and learnings from this study can be expanded to other disease areas. Starting with these kind of hybrid models, um, a clinical trial plus secondary data, I think will really help to increase the acceptability of the secondary data. And the other area that I wanted to touch upon briefly um, is about the regulatory uncertainty in conducting observational studies for regulatory decision making. As Mark mentioned earlier in the paper states, there's a well-established history of the FDA using real-world evidence to support labeling changes related to safety. But from a safety perspective, the hurdle for acceptance of RWE to show a risk is less than the hurdle to not show a risk. And then even going forward, it's further to show a benefit. Um, one example would be in using XUS data. XUS data has been acceptable um, when examining risk, but it was stated in the framework that the fitness for use of this data in regulatory decision-making for effectiveness could be limited by differences in the healthcare system. And here I think transparency and understanding the data and communicating what the differences are in the population will also help the acceptability um, of the secondary data. Another example I think Jenny had mentioned was using active comparison groups. The explanation of benefits of using an active comparison group versus a placebo or vice versa will also help the acceptability of secondary data. And finally, I think that there is still uncertainty about the thresholds for showing effectiveness. So I think understanding the data and the ability to articulate transparently the methods, results, and limitations will provide clarity on when and how we can use real-world evidence as part of evidence packages to support decisions related to effectiveness labeling changes. So thank you for the opportunity to comment. Great. Uh, thank, thank you very much, uh, Keely. It's uh, been a great discussion from all of you. We are a little tight on time with those uh, excellent comments, but um, and summarizing some of what we've heard uh, this this morning and and uh, uh, comments from others, a lot of discussion around 
Um, I think uh, Josh, uh, you and others mentioned the uh, culture shift here and uh, understandable caution and um, need for more uh, trust and credibility as these um, data and methods become more widely used. So many of you commented on that. I'm wondering if uh, just in sort of a quick lightning round across the group, if, uh, if we could ask you for um, your uh, any reactions or next steps or particular issue you'd like to emphasize uh, uh, quickly in terms of where we go from here, uh, building on the comments you've heard, uh, um, the studies underway around um, uh, comparisons um, um, uh, like uh, the Harmony study that was mentioned, others to uh, RCT duplicate, uh, et cetera. Um, next steps to really help build out that trust and credibility. People talked about transparency, um, also been ideas around pre-specification of, of models, transparency on that, maybe even registration. Um, it's uh, an important idea that you all would like to see developed further. And um, uh, Josh, maybe we could start with you and Sebastian. Sure, I can start and Sebastian can chime in as well. So I think for me it's really, um, figuring out how at the individual study level, um, beyond kind of in general whether observational research in RWE can, can get the right answer, um, that demonstrating at the individual level the results of that specific study are credible. And I think there's still more methods work to be done in, in trying to figure out what are the uh, ways to detect biases so that for every single study we can say, you know, we think we got the right answer. Yeah. Yeah. Right, and Sebastian, just, just adding to that, I think you mentioned this already, this transparency is absolutely critical in this process, and also yeah. developing tools. We're in the process of developing tools, uh, helping uh, uh, reviewers, whether it is the FDA or any other stake on a healthcare system, uh, to better and faster and with confidence understand what was done and whether that leads likely to a valid study finding. So I, I think we, there's still work to be done here. This document is fantastic, fantastic foundation for that. Thank you. Great, thank you. Jenny, uh, can I just, um... Okay, Jenny, yeah, please go ahead. Thanks. I was just going to add, you know, I think efforts that can bring clinical medicine closer together with clinical research are important. And I say that because many of these traditional trials um, are, are using endpoints that aren't often used in routine care. So I think some efforts around, like what Forenzo Cancer Research has been doing, um, to evaluate and identify real-world endpoints that can be used for regulatory decision-making um, would be, I, I think that would be uh, very yeah. useful, too. Great. Thanks, Jenny. Those are important endpoints. Um, uh, Joe? Uh, yeah, I would echo the point that Sebastian just made. And, you know, the work that he and Josh have done has really sort of set the standard, which is that the, the, the key is about the, this aspect of transparency, about you know, pre-specifying, being very clear on, you know, what data are being used, how the endpoints are being defined, what analyses are going to be done, making those, uh, you, know, rep you know, essentially registering the, th this work before it starts, mm -hmm. um, and then making a commitment to report all results. And then I think broadly, our, you know, our confidence in, in this work as a community and it's, are, is going to increase, you know, through, through the use of, uh, you know, the pressure testing methods like positive, negative, and c controls, that Josh mentioned, the use of different methods like built, discussed, mm -hmm. and also that, as I mentioned briefly, the you know reproducing findings across databases, across patient samples. That's going to uh, help us, you know, better believe what we're finding. All right. Uh, thank you, uh, Bill. Yeah, it's, uh, I completely agree with the transparency focus. Um, you know, it, it, traditionally though, it's been a challenge because. Um, there hasn't really been a place to register these um, these uh, secondary data set type analyses. The traditional places like uh, clinicaltrials.gov are really designed for clinical trials or for primary data collection and observational big observational studies. Um, there are efforts underway that uh, ISPOR is involved with and Duke Margolis is in involved in those as well to um, begin to uh, attack that problem and um, uh, knock down the barriers to um, uh, creating a, um, a new sort of platform for registration of such studies. And I think that's a, you know, a practical step that needs to be accomplished in order to really kind of scale uh, the registration and transparency of these treatment effects studies with observational data. 
Yeah, uh, thanks for highlighting those steps. And Keeley? Yeah, I just follow up to what Bill just said about um, registering studies. I think you know we have clinical trials stuck up, but you're right, it isn't very good in registering observational studies. And sponsors also um, register their studies on their own websites. However, you know it, it may not be as transparent as it needs to be, or connect to other sources. So we may think about connecting those sources maybe to clinicaltrials.gov or some other source that we, you know, patients and providers can access this information more readily. Well, I want to thank all of you for the thoughtful comments and the, the, the very helpful perspectives on this uh, broad and challenging area of, uh, of credibility around methods for um, turning real-world data into real-world evidence. Clearly a lot going on thanks to your efforts and, and a lot more to come thanks to the framework and the steps forward that, that you all have described. Um, and as we did just discuss, uh, all of this is fitting into um, uh, the, the concept of a, a larger uh, set of evidence that can be brought to bear for regulatory and for that matter other uh, decisions involving medical products. And that brings us to our second session uh, today on how real-world evidence can be used to support regulatory decisions related to product effectiveness labeling changes through a totality of evidence approach. Uh, not a term that maybe everybody's familiar with, although the, the concept uh, makes intuitive sense. Um, we've developed it in this uh, second paper, which explains the totality of evidence approach, outlines components of an evidence package, and considers how an evidence package, including real-world evidence, can contribute to the substantial evidence within a totality of evidence approach and, and form a, an effectiveness labeling change. That is the, uh, the regulatory standard. And the timing of this work and the discussion we're having today I think is especially relevant given that FDA just released its uh, draft guidance, I guess a real update on demonstrating substantial evidence of effectiveness for human drug and biological products. This is a very recent update to FDA's important uh, 1998 guidance on the topic, which was written before uh, a lot of these potential sources of evidence uh, uh, could be brought to bear. So um, uh, that this is fitting into an important regulatory, uh, uh, developing regulatory context here too. Um, so to kick this off, we're gonna hear from Stacy Holdworth, who's a Methods Work Group member. She's gonna provide a high level overview of the paper and that's gonna be followed by perspectives from um, some excellent panelists and, uh, and a little bit of time hopefully for discussion. Uh, Dr. Holdsworth is Senior Advisor for U.S. Regulatory Policy and Strategy at Eli Lilly. And uh, Stacey, I'll turn it over to you now. Hey, thanks, Mark. Can you guys hear me okay? Yes, please go ahead. Well, oh, thanks for the opportunity to be part of the webinar today and to share the overview of this most recent white paper to be released by the Collaborative. The paper is entitled Adding Real-World Evidence to a Totality of Evidence evidence approach for evaluating marketed product effectiveness. So I'll try to get through what all those words mean in the next 10 minutes. Uh, so like Mark said, uh, my name is Stacey Holter, and I was a member of that work group to produce a document. The group was a multi-stakeholder group, including several pharmaceutical company members, data owners, methods experts, and patient groups. So thanks to all of them for their contributions. The white paper responds to the growing interest in using RWD and RWE. Um, RWE studies can complement evidence from randomized controlled trials and contribute to a robust evidence package for decision making. There's a really well-established history of FDA using RWE to support labeling changes related to safety. I think that was mentioned in the earlier panel. However, RWE studies might also be useful in labeling changes related to effectiveness. As many of the folks on this call know, RWD has the potential to provide more representative information on a therapy's impact in a broader patient population, capture the evolving standard of care, and better reflect routine clinical care. So with the increased duration of relevant and reliable data and with development and of the advanced analytic methods to make valid causal inference, I really think RWD has the potential to complement the evidence generated from RCTs and fill knowledge gaps for healthcare decisions. Let's go on to the next slide, um, and, and this has been covered previously, but FDA did release their um, framework for real, the Real World Evidence Program, and so let's, let's um, move ahead here on the slides. Um, this paper uh, responds to point number two of the framework, and if you go to the next slide, the outline of the discussion today, then 
is that first I'll go over what the totality of evidence approach is. This part of the paper uh, outlines the components that make up an evidence package and the role of clinical and regulatory context for assessing the benefits and risks of the product. Next, then the paper looks at examining the weighting of each of the successive pieces of evidence in a package. And then last, the paper looks at remaining barriers for, uh, to RWE use in regulatory decision making and suggest a few potential paths forward. So what is the totality of evidence approach? Let's go to the next slide. A review of the literature shows that FDA can, can and does use a totality of evidence approach today. For example, in an FDA publication, Sherman et al. states, the FDA considers the totality of evidence when evaluating the safety and effectiveness of new drugs. This phrase reflects the nature of drug development with each successive piece of data building on prior data to provide the quantity and quality of evidence needed to adequately assess risks and benefits. So we have that there on the slide. Uh, data from a study are always assessed within the context of other available data, never in isolation, and data from different studies are considered based on the reliability of a given study result, end quote. So a totality of evidence approach requires reviewers to consider the previously submitted evidence, the new evidence in the, in the subsequent package, as well as the clinical and regulatory context that underpin the regulatory decision at hand. So let's go into each of those pieces. Uh, next slide, please. The components of prior and new evidence packages. So regulatory decisions involving effectiveness labeling changes made after the initial product approval generally consist of clinical studies. Uh, this has traditionally been made up of RCTs, but really, can, if you think about it, clinical studies can have interventional and non-interventional treatment assignment, and they can include both primary and second data, secondary data. So as we learn more about the potential use of RWD, there could be situations in the future where these clinical studies are made up of both RCTs and RWEs. And the specific types and amount of evidence needed will be determined on a case-by-case -case basis considering the prior evidence as well as clinical and regulatory context. So let's go on to the next slide and look at proximity uh, of the change to the label. So we've established that regulatory and clinical context determine the acceptability of each piece of evidence for a specific effectiveness labeling change. So let's break that down. And it, and we look at regulatory context in this paper um, with regard to two aspects. First, the type of labeling change being pursued, and then second, the proximity of the proposed labeling change to the original label. Labeling changes extend, extend beyond just the addition of new indications. They include making changes to dose, regimen, and route of administration, use in new subpopulations, or the addition of safety information. So the ability to rely on prior evidence to support this newly proposed labeling change really degrees on the degree, depends on the degree to which the proposed label differs from the original. So when labeling changes are within close proximity to the, to the original label, that is to the left end of the x-axis of this picture, FDA might consider relying more on existing data to make up this exceptional substantial evidence while a labeling change that's more removed from the original label, and that's at the right end of this x-axis, those might uh, require more new evidence. Let's go into slide eight. Um, clinical context is another concept that we looked at. Clinical context is a multi multifaceted and includes consideration of the disease state, treatment alternatives, and patient and provider perspectives. Uh, clinical context considerations can uh, also contribute to the quantity and the type of new evidence that should be required in a su submission package in support of a specific effectiveness labeling change. So as examples, reviewers will consider disease prevalence and disease severity, as well as the availability of treatment alternatives when determining the appropriate makeup of an, of an evidence package. So after you consider the regulatory and clinical context, we have to look at the components of these evidence packages. So if we go on to the next slide, uh, using a totality of evidence approach, each piece of evidence in the package contributes a different quote unquote weight to inform an effectiveness labeling change decision. The weight describes the degree to which each piece of evidence contributes. So the weight of an individual piece of evidence can increase depending on the clinical context, such as instances with high level of unmet need. And the regulatory context can also affect the weight, such as a labeling change to include a new population that's highly similar to the population that was in the original approval. So if each piece of evidence is not weighted highly, um, 
you know, you would conclude that additional studies are going to be required to be the threshold of substantial evidence. So if you look at these figures, it's a, it's a little bit confusion, so let me try to walk you through it. On the left side of this, the figure on this slide visually depicts several hypothetical examples of the types of studies that could make up an evidence package for a particular regulatory decision. The first one on the left shows the types of studies that make up an ev evidence package for an original new in uh, submission. All the rest of them are for labeling changes. So for labeling changes, the evidence submitted to support the original indication becomes the prior evidence, and as discussed previously, the new studies are typically existing in clinical studies. So the second scale will demonstrate a scenario where the additional clinical studies are all clinical trials in the form of RCTs. The third and fourth scales demonstrate scenarios um, where the potential role of RWE studies uh, could be there where um, there's two different contributions of weight, um, one being greater for RWE and one being less. The final scale then demonstrates the potential for an evidence package that comprises prior evidence and new evidence where this new evidence only consists of RWE. So at the end of the white paper, there's actually an appendix that goes through a number of real and hypothetical examples to try to illustrate the concept. But really, any of these um, visual depictions could end up being what uh, data packages look like in the future. So before I conclude, I do, I do want to mention some of the remaining barriers to RWE use for regulatory decision making that were identified by the work group. Um, as you can see from this discussion, this framework is definitely just a starting point for enabling the consideration of RWE. The circumstances of each potential use case have to be considered to determine if and how to proceed, and there have not been very many regulatory precedents from, from which to learn. For that reason, really close discussions between sponsors and FDA are going to be critical to advancing the field. Uh, the FDA has established the centralized RWE subcommittee of the Office of Medical Policy, which is serving in this role to date. It's going to be important for them to capture learning from these early proposals to make sure that we can inform future guidance. Uh, more formalized pilot programs may even be necessary to create predictability and consistency. And further, it's anticipated that additional resources are needed dedicated to RWE for this purpose by both sponsors and regulators, and their expertise is going to be needed to be distributed through various therapeutic areas and sponsor companies and then within the review divisions at FDA. So in summary, RWE has a great potential to contribute valuable information to the evidence package for effectiveness labeling change through this totality of evidence approach. For a marketed product to be determined effective for a new indication, the evidence in totality must be substantial and a totality of evidence approach considers both prior and new evidence, as well as the clinical and regulatory context to get to the final decision. That's all I have today. Thanks for the chance to share the paper. Great. Thanks, Stacey, for covering so much uh, from this paper in limited time and also looking forward. And, and I'm looking forward to hearing from our panelists. Uh, first, we're going to hear from Rachel Sherman, who's a senior policy fellow here at Duke Margolis. Uh, Next, uh, Alyssa Lavange, who's Professor and Associate Chair of the Department of Biostatistics in the Gilling School of Global Public Health at UNC Chapel Hill. Previously, uh, uh, she too, like Rachel, uh, uh, worked on many of these issues uh, and uh, led efforts at FDA. Uh, next, we'll hear from Solomon Ayasu, who's Vice President and Global Head of Pharmacoepidemiology, the Center for Observational and Real World Evidence at Merck. Uh, and then uh, last but not least, Mark Berger, uh, Special Advisor for Real World Evidence at ISPOR. So we're going to have uh, five minutes of comments from each, uh, starting off with uh, Rachel. Uh, thank you, Mark. Um, and uh, thanks, Stacey, for, for a very thorough overview of, a, of what is a, is a paper that tries to tackle a, a large amount of information. I think I'd like to use my time to to reemphasize some of the points that were made and, of course, go back to, to terminology because I think, do think that the biggest barrier to adoption of RWE, RWD is, is, is confusion, a little bit of nervousness, and then, of course, we need to brave, if you will, first comers who are, who are willing to, to take the risk of doing something a little different than it's that has been done before in, in their in their organizations. Um, Mark, you, you did a, a very thorough job of, of, of uh, and thank you, of going over the regulatory definitions of RWD and RWE, and those are 
fairly crucial. I'd just like to remind everyone of the statutory definition because I think it's very important to my, my main point. And the statutory de definition has to do with um, it, the, the RWE, okay, so the client got a little confused here and they said data, they forgot to say that. It's regarding usage, benefit or risk of, of drug derived from sources other than traditional clinical trials. And, that, and the reason I'm emphasizing that is there is no reason why RWE cannot come from a randomized controlled trial. The, the, the point, when I was at FDA, um, that we spent a lot of time, time trying to emphasize that the real world peace, which is, which is a funny term if you think, if you think about it, but, but the, the, that terminology became fixed pretty quickly has to do with where the data, the measurement is made. It doesn't have anything to do with the design of the trial. It's where. It's secondary or primary, it's where. Um, the other part, the design of the trial, if there is to be a trial, is a completely separate question. So there is no reason why there couldn't be a randomized controlled trial done in, quote, the real world setting, the place where the patient lives and functions, their practice community, their home, whatever. And I think it's really important to make that point because although in general secondary use, such as fentanyl, is, is our data derived in, if you will, the real world for other purposes and then repurposed for answering other types of questions, it, RWD and RWE don't have to be that. They don't have to be secondary use, and they, they don't, and nothing precludes them there from being a trial, even, I suppose, a placebo-controlled trial. That obviously would take a very large change in the way our, our current system works, but it, it is always worth keeping that in mind, that we, we need to separate out where the data are being collected and then how they are being studied. So that was the major point I wanted, I wanted to make. And I think as we get more experience and more familiarity, we'll, we'll struggle a little less with, with, with those issues. Um, I think it is always worth remembering, and since I've been here long enough, I know this, that, that way back when, uh, there have been approvals, way back when, not so way back when, there have been approvals, actual approvals, of NMEs on what we might consider, what in those days we call it case studies, but uh, we might consider RWD becoming RWE. Data becomes information, information becomes evidence. The ones I always cite are intravenous against cyclovir and amiodor, and both of which were approved on, 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 on a case, case studies or case series. Uh, so while that's not necessarily preferable, sometimes circumstance requires that and if it's a very serious, if it's a serious life threatening disease, there's a huge unmet medical need and those days exist, it's, we, I think, I, can't, I don't speak for the agency, but, but certainly at that time we felt um, uh, it was very important to try and use every ounce of data we could find in that. I think that remains true today since we seem to have a huge, uh, uh, continue to have a huge evidence yeah. about some products. Um, yeah. Just one last point. I don't know if I'm over my, I'm close to my five minutes. The totality yeah, does it. Wrap. All right, I'll wrap it up. Go totality ahead. does it is, is, and I, I give a lot of credit to my colleagues here at Duke for um, trying to take a term that has been incredibly useful in the biosimilars arena where we, it was a whole new way of thinking and bringing it into the RWD, RWE area where, again, we're trying to have, to introduce a whole new way of thinking. And now, Mark, I'll shut up. Great. No, thank, thanks very much, Rachel. I appreciate the connection to the FDA statute and, and where FDA is coming from on this, too. Um, next is Lissa. Yes, thank you, um, Mark. Hopefully everyone can hear me. Um, I appreciate yeah. the opportunity. Sorry. I appreciate the opportunity Great. to be on the panel, and I really enjoyed reading the white papers, both of them, and hearing the um, presentations uh, as well. Um, I. I have as a status, I am a statistician, and so I'm used to focusing on um, what can go wrong, right, with an RWE study <laughs> when you don't have randomization. Um, and all of the discussions and the points made in the first session were really right on target. And I do think um, that the FDA has done a great job of, of trying to get more guidance out. Some of that I'll take credit for when I was there. <laughs> but uh, since I've left, it's been nice to see the 
RWE framework document come out. This uh, new document you just alluded to, Mark, the clinical, uh, sorry, the substantial evidence standard document that I believe is an update of the 98 um, document on clinical evidence of effectiveness that came out of the uh, 1997 um, SODANA Act to update SEDUFA, all these acronyms, um, is really nice because that 98 document talked about when you had uh, special circumstances for a one sing a single study submission uh, joined with or supported by other, ty other types of evidence that might be um, mechanistic and so forth. This, that's more of a quantity of evidence, one study versus two. The 2019 document that came out in December is about quality, and quality of evidence is all about the first session that we had today. Um, and, and quality being broken into some of the things that were talked about, the design of the study, the endpoints, and then the statistical analysis and level of uncertainty and so forth. Um, I think I wasn't going to, um, but anyway, so I just, I wanted to just say that we do have quite a lot of, of guidance out there um, to help people um, through, think through what type of evidence they're supporting. Our particular task was about how RWE could be coupled with um, the evidence that supported the, the enemy or the first submission, first use of the product uh, to expand the label or in some way uh, expand the population or tumor type, for example, or maybe go to another dose or something. Um, and, and I really liked the diagram. The visuals were terrific in the Duke Margulis report that was just presented to us. Um, a couple of comments, and I also will react a little bit to what Rachel just said about the the, the where uh, of the RWD and RWE, uh, and that randomized trials can be uh, also contributing to RWE. And I think that's true. I think the real world, although it doesn't have a scientific definition, could apply to the people, that, that you have more of a real world population. It could apply to the endpoints. Often in uh, the more pragmatic type of trial, the endpoints are things that really mean something to patients and might be less important to regulators. So. Uh, but this December guidance talks about clinically meaningful endpoints as, uh, as being important for substantial evidence. And I think there are some endpoints that are good and that you, you can more rely on if you're looking at real-world data than others. And I think that's a problem. I think the um, folks in the first session talked about that, the, the duration of exposure and also the length of follow-up to wait if you're waiting for an event to occur on a database being used for secondary purposes uh, to provide evidence. And you can also have the real world nature in the, um, the way the patient's treated, right? A little bit more hands-off approach is what I think people usually associate with real world studies. And all, all of these things are departures from our very tightly controlled, very well-defined study population, very um, carefully monitored administration of the intervention. Uh, typical randomized trial, right? That's, that's what we have is more of a lab experiment in our typical randomized trial. And then you just start relaxing all of those aspects and you get a little bit more and more and more real world. So I think if I understood Rachel correctly, this idea of a continuum from the traditional to the real world is, is really what we're dealing with more than a dichotomy. That being said, while I was at FDA and since then, there's no question the interest to me that I hear from patient advocacy groups, from academic researchers, from sponsors, everybody wants to know if they can use observational studies, right? <laughs> the data exists there. Sometimes the evidence could be overwhelming. And I think this is something that hasn't been touched on but that has resonated with me. If there is a, an approved drug and it's being used off-label and there are uh, data sources from Sentinel or from HMOs, um, claims data, patient registries, whatever, um, real-world data sources showing that this off-label use looks promising for another indication, then can that evidence be so overwhelming that, that it's hard to ignore? And, and I think that's where the, um, the problem really lies. How do you package that together with the, with the traditional trials that got the initial approval to um, convince the agency or to, to support a regulatory decision. And I think that's the reason patient advocates have gotten behind a lot of the use of real world evidence. There's a lot of data out there. We collect a lot of data. And the data, you know, they're not all terrible, right? There's, there are good, reasonably good data. Or if they're not good, we have the tools now to evaluate their quality and completeness and so forth. So 
So there could be evidence that's overwhelming and hard to ignore. And, in the, and if that's the case, how do you package it? And I think the Duke Margolis paper uh, does a good job of talking about how to package it. The one thing I would say, uh, just in, in closing to keep in my time, um, I like the idea of thinking ahead of time about how to weight the different parts of your evidence package. I think in practice that's hard to do. Um, when I, I think of a parallel with, a, with a, some forays we made when I was at FDA, looking at quantitative approaches to benefit risk assessment, where qualitative approaches are hard enough, but if you try to put numbers on the weights to balance things, it gets even harder. And I, I think that that same kind of um, issue could arise here. It's, maybe you can talk qualitatively that for this submission package, we want to have heavier weights on the real world evidence, either because the evidence has is, is got the wow factor, um, it's, you know, it looks really good, or uh, because there is incredible unmet need, the clinical context is pushing you to weigh more heavily the real world yeah. evidence. Um, either of those or other situations might be there, but if you, were, if you try to think ahead of time, well, is, it twi is, a, is the RWE worth a whole other study? Is it worth half a study? Is it worth two studies? I mean, I, you know, I'm being a little bit of a devil's advocate, but I think that's where this stuff gets hard. And I don't know the extent to which um, pharmaceutical sponsors would want some kind of understanding ahead of time um, about what, what their, their yeah. real world evidence study could be worth. So, so that's where I think maybe um, talking more about the details and how to put this in practice would be, would be really useful. Anyway, thanks very much great. for the opportunity. Lisa, great comments. I like that uh, qualitative, you know, small, medium, large uh, version of um, um, what probably is hard to do is a quantitative weighting and in, in, in totality of evidence. So, anyway, great comments. Um, we are running a little bit tight of time, and I want to make sure we hear from both Solomon and, and um, Mark. So, uh, next is uh, Solomon Ayasu, who also has, uh, prior to his current work, uh, a lot of FDA experience, too. Solomon? Yes. Hi. Can you hear me? Yeah, can you hear me? Go ahead. Okay, great. Well, thank you, Mark. Uh, thank you for um, uh, to Duke as well for inviting me to the webinar. Um, great presentation, mm -hmm. and I had the pleasure of working on uh, uh, some of the thinking around this. So uh, I I'm going to take my comments from the perspective of um, uh, the totality of evidence uh, approach, uh, really anchoring it on what the paper is uh, focused on. Uh, it's uh, really focused on um, adding some, you know, a labeling, um, whether it's a new indication or broadening an indication or a, a different route of administration or a number of uh, uh, labeling revisions that can happen in the course of the marketed uh, life of a product. Um, uh, so I will take it from there instead of focusing really on uh, individual uh, study credibility, and I would just assume that the body of evidence uh, uh, that would be you know, weighted uh, to decide whether to label or not uh, is really uh, based on uh, uh, a quantity of evidence that uh, may be presented, uh, which will complement sort of the original or the prior evidence that was uh, basis for the, uh, uh, for the approval. So in the context of that, uh, uh, that th there's a critical question when you're considering, I guess, you're adding uh, a new, new information or adding a new indication to an existing marketed product. There's really, the question is not really about whether there's drug activity in the disease area uh, or whether the drug works because that's already been established based on the clinical studies uh, which uh, were the basis for the um, you know, original approval. The question becomes really, you know, what is the, the type of um, data that you would need to make the different uh, labeling changes? For example, uh, consideration in terms of whether you are expanding the age, um, uh, the age uh, groups that would be uh, indicated for a, a particular uh, uh, drug. Uh, would necessarily require sort of a clearer understanding of uh, the clinical context uh, for how you might use the, you know, the, the, the drug or in the expanded situation, understanding the disease epidemiology, disease course, uh, prevalence and incidence, severity, 
uh, natural history of the disease, uh, whether the, the, there's a difference between age groups, for example, in terms of how the, uh, the disease progresses over time, and uh, uh, an assumption that, uh, or a knowledge base that would tell you that the uh, purported uh, activity is obtainable as well in that new population, expanded population. For a dose is simpler. For dose change or rather administration, it is really simpler. You're not really trying to establish uh, uh, um, a lot of um, the evidence around effectiveness. And maybe really, you may be concerned more about the safety aspects of a different rather of, you know, administration of a higher dose or lower dose or frequency change. So, so that it is important to consider that in terms of what is the labeling change, what is the clinical question you're trying to address to, for the basis for the new uh, uh, label. The, the second thing I want to mention that, uh, in, as part of the totality of evidence, is you, you know you may have uh, a, 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 a body of evidence that is new that uh, then you're comparing against sort of the the, the prior evidence. Uh, and you're looking at, uh, at that from the perspective of the magnitude of benefit that uh, you know, you, you're seeing in this real world data uh, evidence um, or the consistency across uh, the evidence streams, um, uh, whether the clinical trials and or, or, or also the new body of evidence that would be the, the real world evidence. And then the you know, specificity of the effect, you know, that you're not really seeing a lot of discrepant uh, results in terms of directionality or the magnitude of the effect um, in, in this real world data sources. And then there's a significant correlation between the clinical toxicology, um, the clinical studies, and, and the body of evidence in totality that is sort of the new information that's coming into it. So I'm assuming that. You know the individual credibility questions would have been addressed before you actually consider, uh, you know, the totality of evidence approach to whether to label or not label or approve or not approve. Uh, the other yeah. thing I, I, I want to mention uh, uh, is that uh, that the there is also a dis the differences uh, that one has to consider when making decisions about this because the benefit risk profiles and the balances change with a marketed drug that keeps on accumulating, even if you're not look seeking uh, um, uh, 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 an effectiveness expansion, th there is more knowledge that's accumulating over time in terms of our knowledge about safety. So there's a, a very asymmetric um, accumulation of data, which is heavily weighted on safety. And if, a, if you look at the benefit mix balance at the later stage, and then you're adding a new um, consideration in terms of label, uh, the calculus may be de very different. So one has to be careful about how you weight uh, such evidence in terms of uh, safety and benefits. So I'll stop there in, in the interest of other. Great. Uh, uh, um, thank, thank thanks very much for, for teasing out these different uh, sort of levels of lift for, uh, for, for contributing the, the different the importance of different uh, questions for uh, uh, how much uh, uh, the real world evidence can contribute. Uh, carries on another theme. Uh, because we've had such good comments and, and full, we are running tight on time. And Mark, I want to make sure you get in five minutes. Uh, right now, so um, let's uh, let's turn to you. Thanks, Mark, and thanks for inviting me to be on the panel. As the one non-FDA, never having worked for the FDA person. Um, <laughs> so, I'm going to go at this a little bit differently. Let's be clear. Whatever the evidence that is used to support a label, whether it's randomized controlled trial data or other kinds of evidence, is always a level of uncertainty regarding the risk benefit profile of a therapeutic. And the political situation right now is, is a concern that the FDA might be um, speeding uh, decisions and sacrificing certainty in decision making. And uh, the January 11th editorial in New York Times just recently said, the FDA is in trouble, here's how to fix it. And one of their um, recommendations was slow down on drug and device approval. And I quote, the FDA has made several compromises in recent years, such as accepting quote unquote real world evidence in lieu of traditional clinical trial data 
that have enabled increasingly dubious medical products to seep into the marketplace. So the political context is they, there is a concern that the FDA may be moving too fast to accept new kinds of evidence or surrogate evidence. Um, and it's framed the conversation in, is the evidence standard going down? And this shows a fundamental misunderstanding of the fact that the FDA has always tried to keep the same level of uh, uh, credi uh, credibility and uh, standards for their evidence. And their tolerance for uncertainty varies with the level of potential regret for incorrect decisions. So that when they're talking about a disease that uh, is very prevalent and involves millions of patients, th there is a greater concern with getting it right than if it's an orphan disease um, and only affects a few number of patients. If there are treatment alternatives, then they want to make, make real sure any new treatment really provides something new and beneficial. Whereas if there are no treatment alternatives, and a particularly if an illness is, um, uh, has a high morbidity, then they're going to be willing to accept more uncertainty. And of course, there is the issues of mechanism of action and biological plausibility. Now, that's true for both randomized controlled clinical trial data and real world evidence. Now for RWE, there are other considerations and that's where the paper on the totality of evidence is quite correct in talking about the proximity to original labeling and clinical regulatory context. If it's not much of a lift, then there is less risk. Then there's the question, is it feasible to conduct randomized control trials? If you can't conduct a randomized control trial, you have nothing else to live with other than real world data. Then there's the effect size. If you have a very big effect size, people are gonna to tend to believe the results and discount the concern around noise and um, making an incorrect decision when the effect size is very large. And then there was a discussion on the first paper about data quality, accuracy and reliability of the evidence, which is getting better all the time. But clearly the FDA uh, is willing to accept things that it knows better than things it doesn't know. And that's why I think they've been very enthusiastic about flat iron data, because flat iron data is just chart review data that we've been using for a long, long time done by expert chart reviewers. It's not lang natural language processing. So given the political environment, the FDA is going to take steps where it thinks there is the least amount of risk. And they've been doing it for years. We've been adding safety information all the time based on real world evidence. And if there's no likelihood that there's going to be a randomized controlled clinical trial uh, conducted and the evidence seems good enough, why not? So you change your dose, your dose regimen, or your route of administration. And then more um, importantly, when the limited, there's a limited population being impacted and you're going to add, a, add or modify an indication, that's where we're seeing more and more with rare diseases in oncology where it may not be possible uh, to, 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 to do a large randomized controlled trial. So the greatest controversy and where the real issue is, is adding comparative effectiveness information where larger populations are potentially impacted and this concern over what is the effect size and how much noise is there and do we believe that we're getting a true positive result? And yeah. I don't have a particular answer for that, but I do know we need to educate and reframe the conversation that this is not about lowering standards of evidence. This is about efficiency. This is about promoting the development of a learning healthcare system how, and how FDA can promote the learning healthcare system into being, and how the FDA right. can be part of a learning healthcare system. Yeah. And right. that is lost in the conversation okay. because the political yeah. environment is if it's not broke, don't fix it. Okay. Mark, um, thank, thanks for those comments and thanks for all your support for, for this effort. I uh, also want to thank our other panelists. So, 
great discussion of a broad uh, topic, and, and the panelists did a nice job of breaking it down. Uh, given that we're at the hour, I want to thank everyone uh, who joined us today for their time. Uh, just a reminder, if you uh, look at the um, uh, next uh, slide, I think, on uh, uh, we do have some more activities coming up. Uh, please stay in touch with us if you're not on our uh, contact list, uh, please get there. Um, you can just go to our website to sign up. Um, lots of activities coming up in this important and developing space. I also want to highlight our October 1st, 4th annual public meeting on real world evidence. Uh, thanks again to all of you for joining for on the webinar and uh, to everyone from our real world evidence collection.